Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. My folks were tough. How, How tough, tough were, were they? they? <laughs> when I was born, they took one look at this puss of mine and told me to get lost. Ooh. <laughs> this Thirsty night episode, crowd. <laughs> this is episode 102, recorded June 17th, 2021. Magazine. May the fleas and thousand St. Bernards infest your armpits. <laughs> I am your host, Jeff Moore. On this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monsters, spirits, psychos, and villains that have haunted movie-going audiences since the dawn of film history. We're also part of the Gruesome Magazine family of video podcasts, which includes Horror News Radio, the Gruesome Magazine podcast, Heroes and Droids, and Decades of Horror, the classic era, the 1970s and the 1980s. Please subscribe to, comment, and like on the Gruesome Magazine YouTube channel. Please, please subscribe, please. Um, you can also listen to audio-only versions of each podcast on most podcast apps by subscribing to Gruesome Magazine and or horror news radio and don't forget to check us out also on the classic sci-fi movie channel our podcasts are shown there that's available on roku apple tv amazon fire tv android tv places i've never been before across all <laughs> ott platforms um and they got a lot of cool uh classic science fiction movies there which we will be uh um crossing over here pretty soon doing some of their content with yeah. me this week are my incredible co-ghosts <laughs> what I, God, I swear every time it's like i like it the first time uh whitney Cato, <laughs> whitney Cato, an accomplished artist makeup artist and writer whitney how are you i'm good how are you i'm good i'm good yeah. i've stayed inside it's 101 outside oh. today so ouch um, staying oh, inside. It's better Chad, than being in a desert <laughs> in the movie. Yeah, Chad Hunt, um, uh, one of our OG hosts, <laughs> is not able to be with us this week. I hate it when real life interferes, work, and, and mm -hmm. such whatnot. Um, but he'll be back, and he is going to miss us, I'm sure. Also with us is Daphne, the awesome, stupendous, and likable as hell co-host. How are you, Daphne? I'm doing really good. Thank you. It's only Excellent. 74 here. Good, good. <laughs> That's nice. See, I, I say this. I say how hot it is here, so people. I don't want people coming to Iowa. I like it. Got it. Unpopulated. <laughs> anyway. It's pouring uh, down rain here, and everybody's depressed. Oh. No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's what the Seattleites say. Yeah. Keep exactly. say, yeah. <laughs> I've been there. I know that. I live there. <laughs> also with us is Joseph Perry, contributing writer to Gruesome Magazine and contributing writer to The Scariest Things, When It Was Cool, Horror Fuel, and Ghastly Grinning Websites, Phantom of the Movies, Videoscope Magazine, The Drive-In Asylum Zine, and Diabolique Magazine and co-host of the Uphill Both Ways podcast. How are you, Joseph? I'm feeling lonely, so I'm hitching a ride. Uh, <laughs> but not too lonely, actually. Doing pretty well. Uh, bright and early on a Friday morning for me. So uh, I'm happy to be here and talk about this excellent, excellent film. Good, good. I'm fired up. So this one, um, some people might not think, not traditionally thought of as a horror film, usually more frequently thought of as film noir. The Hitchhiker from 1953, directed by Ida Lupino, uh, written by Collier Young and Ida Lupino, who I believe was uh, her husband at the time that they wrote this from an adaptation by Robert Joseph. And there was some uncredited work from Daniel Mainwaring, which is a name you'll recognize if you've listened to our podcast for a while. The cinematography 
is by Nicholas Musaraka, who you should also be familiar with if you listened to us for a while. Uh, cast includes Edmund O'Brien, Frank Lovejoy, William Tallman, and Jose Torve. Torve. Uh, production company is The Filmmakers, which was uh, uh, Lupino and Young's company and distributed by RKO Radio Pictures. Filming locations were the Alabama Hills, Lone Pine, California, and Big Pine, California. It sure looked like Mexico to me. I don't know. They had me convinced. Um, yes. <laughs> filming dates were June 24th, 1952 to late July, and it was released on March 20th, 1953 in Boston for the premiere. Now, there's no information on the budget, but in reading about Ida Lupino, the films that she did for RKO, they said that they were the budget was usually under 160000 So I'm going to put this in that class. Uh, just as a guesstimate, the domestic box office one point nine million. Not too shabby, I don't. I don't think. I don't uh, think so. Short synopsis: Two fishermen pick up a psychotic escaped convict, who tells them that he intends to murder them when the ride is over. Sounds horrific to me, and maybe kind of strangely like the Hitcher. <laughs> that we did on 80s a little little while ago. Um, so, yeah, and there's our three main characters that are on the screen most of the time. Kind of backseats the hitter. I think I, this is definitely a horror-adjacent film noir. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, as I'm watching this, and, uh, well, well, we'll get into that. I digress. I, I love that shot from that photo, though. That, yeah, uh, it is. That I, cap I, such, that's a great, great shot. Yeah, yeah and there was a lot of scenes in the car, and it was well mm -hmm. used, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the first time we see the hitchhiker, when they pick him up, his face is in the shadow, which mm -hmm. is even more. Yes. Can Working titles for this were The Persuader and The Difference. The Difference? Hmm. I don't know. So later is putting it mildly. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's get to the uh, taglines here. And I don't know. Is anybody like all fired up to do taglines? There's only three. Well, I will. And if nobody else wants to, but I'm happy to others after my incredible Carson monologue. Fire away. <laughs> sure. All right. <laughs> When was the last time you invited death into your car? I can't say that I ever have, but <laughs> who who will Why? be his next victim? <laughs> you. <laughs> you. There's death in his upraised thumb. <laughs> I, know. I could just picture it's like in for man. <laughs> Oh, wow. And for a man. <laughs> Bolts shooting out of his thumb. Okay. Why would anybody invite death into their car? But... I, I don't know. As we know from prior experience, there's very little connection to uh, reality. reality. Here. So <laughs> let's look at a couple of posters here. Um, that's kind of the standard one. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to be on the uh, in the front seat in that shot. No, I do love and, the red. No, yeah, yes. Who will be his next? Victim? <laughs> and these are a couple other uh, sort of landscape type versions that have. Mm -hmm. There's death in his upraised thumb. I, <laughs> I, <see that. laughs> I have a confession that it took me. I was like, "What?" It took me a while to figure out what. Oh, what they of were course, talking he's about. a hitchhiker. Duh. At, but at it was some point, just like such a weird thing to say. That's all right. At some point, I'll tell my hitchhiking story. <laughs> um, but you know what? We need to get to first impressions. And, and okay. this is Whitney's pick. So, uh, Whitney, um, yeah, when did you first see this? And what are your impressions? So, 
it, this has been one of those movies that I have known that has been around that I've seen around for as long as I could remember, but I have only seen clips and pieces of it. And I thought, you know, I really need to sit down and give this some time. And though I know it's not necessarily what people would say horror, but I remember it having thriller elements and it had a story to it that relayed to true events. And from the little pieces that I have known, just knowing that uh, it had those true elements of someone coming into uh, people's lives and turning things around and just being stuck with someone in a vehicle and that concept is really freaky. So, but no, this is the first time I've actually sat down to watch the whole thing in its entirety. Um, And I've been meaning to, and I wanted to, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, discuss what your takes are. If you think it's horror or, or whatnot, but and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to learn about Ida Lupino because I'm still learning about her. Mm-hmm. The director. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, let's go to Daphne next. Daphne, had you seen this before? And what are your impressions? Well, kind of like Whitney, I th- I've only seen bits and pieces of it. I hadn't actually seen the whole thing, and I didn't know much about it. Um, but I I had heard about Ida Lupino and that she was one of the first. Um, uh, female directors in Hollywood and mainstream in the studio system. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what it, the story, how the story is that I've always heard. And um, so I was really excited to see it. I love noir, but I'm very, um, I got a lot to learn about <laughs> noir, but all the stuff that I've seen, I've loved just how it looks. And um, so I was really excited to see it and I absolutely loved it. I, I just loved watching it. I thought it was a great movie, a beautiful movie, and um, I felt like I reacted to it in a in a lot of really cool ways, and uh, it was great. And I I definitely want to learn more about Ida Lupino. I've only seen her. I've only um, know of her really as an actress. So um, it was cool mm-hmm. to see to watch her at, from the director, and then learn that she. Um, you know, I didn't know that she directed some Twilight episodes. Or, I mean, the Twilight Zone episodes. Not uh-huh. Twilight, um, but the <laughs> Twilight Zone. <laughs> that, Twilight. Some, uh, that she was the only woman that directed a Twilight, ep- a Twilight Zone episode and um, the only person to star and direct in um, one of, any of the Twilight Zone episodes. So yeah, I thought yeah. that was she, super cool, cool, too. Yeah, she started one and directed a, a, another one. Uh, yeah, and and the other the one she directed is the the masks one, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is one we see that picture of all the time of those yeah. faces, you know. Yeah, it's, that one I wasn't as familiar with, but definitely recognized the faces. And the one that she's an actress in, um, I've I've seen that that one so many times. Um, yeah. And she's and she was in a couple of Columbo episodes too, which I love. So yep. Yep. it was great. <laughs> all right. Joseph Perry, how about you? I know you've seen this before. I didn't like that hitchhiker guy. He's very rude. Very demanding. Yes. Bossy. I had some problems with him. Yes. Very bossy. Uh, let's see. Well, I'm pretty sure the first time I saw this, it, I think I ordered the videotape from Sinister Cinema back in the 19 early 1990s i believe Uh, there was a phase in the 90s where i actually uh, took a long break from current horror movies at least and uh, really started diving into film noir and i had read a lot about this and uh, so like i said i saw it then and was really impressed and probably saw it a couple of times during the nineties, but not since. So I was super happy that Whitney chose this to, and so I could revisit it. Uh, Yay. I really like this film quite a bit. And uh, I learned a bit about the Ida Lupino uh, background at that time. I've forgotten a lot of it. So I'm happy to revisit it with you guys today. Uh but I actually got into a lot of her films as an actress at the time. 
because of this and like Daphne mentioned the twilight zone and everything. So it's been a while since I thought about either of those elements, but happy to try to jog the memory banks and talk about them today. So not the first time I've seen it, but the first time in a long time and so happy to revisit it. Awesome. Yeah. I like this film and I got into a, I've always kind of liked noir, not even knowing what it was when I first, you know, was growing up. Um, and I, this particular one, I like a lot because of the tight cast and the drama that they're put in. I mean, right off the bat, when they pick him up and he pulls the gun out, uh, what does he do? I think he asks him for the map and mm -hmm. uh, he apparently can't read the map and keep an eye on him at mm -hmm. the same time or something. But like one of the first things he says is pull off in the first road you come to. And I'm like, you know, what do you think is going to happen? You're the guys in the yeah. front seat. You're mm -hmm. thinking we're pulling off the road and he's going to shoot us and mm -hmm. drive away. Cause you know, if we know who he is and that's what he's been doing. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's incredibly tense uh, to me, especially the first time you mm -hmm. see it. Um, so, yeah, I kind of went on a film noir kick uh, two or three years ago for a couple of years and watched uh, everything I could get my hands on. on there's a lot on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, and they actually have a show on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings called Nightmare Alley or Noir Alley. I'm sorry, Noir Alley. That's hosted mm -hmm. by a kind of a uh, expert. His name slips my mind right now. But it's, it's uh, fun and you get some feedback. You know, you get some information about it. Uh, what's really neat about this movie as we go through it, I think, is as we look at the different people and the different things they did, um, there was some really cool things that happened here that don't ha don't seem to happen in a lot of movies. Like, for example, um, and I forget what his rank was, um, the, the Captain Alvarado, the Mexican policeman, mm -hmm. he's the hero of the film. Mm-hmm. How many other films do you see the, the Mexican captain be anything other than just sort of a there or even corrupt in some way? Right. So yeah. I, I, I just thought that was really mm -hmm. cool. Um, Sidekick at best usually, yeah. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, let's get into this. And you guys stop talking about whatever you want to, to go. I put some stuff together in terms of... Uh, some pictures and we talked about Ida Lupino at first. So there's a couple shots of her mm -hmm. on this set directing or, or, or talking to the actors. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I think in the, in the top shot, she's maybe directing, but, um, those are great and, shots. Uh, aren't yeah. they? Oh, we got William Tallman yeah. and Edmund O'Brien and the other one has mm -hmm. uh, Frank Lovejoy and Edmund O'Brien and she's obviously talking to him and explaining things to him. It looks like she's got a script in her hand. Mm -hmm. Just very, and I like what her her uh, onset attire for directing. Yeah. You know? She, it. it's, it's, it's practical uh, mm -hmm. at any rate. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah. And then a couple of things that we should know her from in the genre. Of course, we have a Batman connection at the bottom. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> she was, uh, what was her name? Dr. Dr. Cassandra huh. in two episodes of Batman. And at the time, the other guy there in the picture, uh, Howard Duff, was her husband. Ah. So, uh, and then anybody recognize the picture in the middle? William Shatner. I was oh, wondering right. if that was William Shatner. Yeah. Wow. That that's from Devil's oh. Reign. Oh, oh yeah. Goodness. Nice. Nice. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, you know, I I I couldn't pick this one up. But the top picture, figure that one out at all. Mm -mm. That's oh. from Food of the Gods. I knew she was oh, in Food goodness. of the Gods, but I don't recognize that picture. Wow. Cool. No. I oh. need to revisit that film. I don't know. I have a, I have a, uh, I have a violent reaction to Marshall Gortner, so. <laughs> but I suppose I could watch it. Either. Um, so anyway, what did, how did you think she, uh, she did here? I, you know, she, 
she directed, and I don't want to steal this, but somebody else has this all figured out, but she had directed like four films for RKO that were based on what they called women's subjects. So mm -hmm. like one, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, is called The Bigamist that she directed and act in, acted in. And uh, I, I forget what the other topics were, but... Um, there was one about rape. Yes, yes. Um, I'm totally forgetting. I'm spacing out in the name. There was one about um, pregnancy, like the unwanted or unwanted yeah. or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, not wanted. Not wanted. Not wanted. <laughs> and that, that's where she got her first directing role when the director uh, got sick and couldn't finish it. Mm. So she went ahead and, and directed it as part of their filmmaker Productions or studio. So, how do you? What do you? What did you think about this? I thought she did a great job. I'll just yeah. jump in. Um, I uh, the atmosphere was awesome. The um, the the tension was amazing. I love all the tight shots in the car. In contrast with the super wide and lonely um, landscape that they were in. Um, I was thinking about you guys is talking about the Hitcher um, from the eighties because it definitely, I definitely felt like the, the landscape was, was also a character, also part of this yeah. story. Um, and I felt so much like, Oh my God, if something happens, they're never, they're never going to find them. Nothing like, how could someone drive through here? Their car's going to break down. You know, it just, I was like, that was really stressful for me too. But I also thought it was super beautiful. Um, I thought that empty, desolate kind of landscape was gorgeous. Um, and uh, uh, this, the story was really, it was a short movie and just really bam, bam, bam. It was going. Um, I thought the actors were great. I, I just, I really, really enjoyed this movie. I, and I, as far as the directing goes, I think it was, it was fabulous. What, what I really liked about it was knowing that it's mostly a male cast and she mm -hmm. took not only a male cast, but a well diverse male cast of the actors that are Latin Hispanic. And then with the ones that are, American and and just molded around um, like you said with the whole atmosphere and seeing and, and then conveying the sh you know the whole sceneries and the tensions with the relationship of the two friends mm -hmm. um, and with this hitchhiker and then seeing you know, like you were saying like in the car and then outside in these desolate areas and being pulled in, around and mentally being messed with by this person. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, have, to know that she has had the eye to place them in certain positions, like there's the one scene, like when, when you have the shot set up with where the cinematographer has displayed where the guy is, um, the hitchhiker, he has his gun pointed and he's messing with the, with the two main characters and he says like for him to set the the bottle or the can mm, on the mm, on the mm. rock and that's like a pretty wide open space and it kind of leaves you guessing like is he really gonna hit this target or is he just messing with him mm -hmm. so that it, yeah. it, it's the mind games of some of these atmospheres that really mess with me and i thought of that one scene was a really good one to mm -hmm. do that he's definitely messing with him isn't he I mean, yes. they call him a psychotic killer, but I, I, I'd go so far as to say sociopathic too. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. Anyway. Well, uh, building on what Whitney mentioned at the beginning of her comments, there, uh, it's interesting that Lapine directing, you know, what they films to this testosterone-driven story. Mm -hmm. And she just did uh, an amazing job with it. Uh, you guys mentioned uh, the landscapes and in the car. And this is one of the rare film noirs that, or films noir, that uh, rather than 
playing in shadow light, shadow and light the whole time. For a lot of it, it's either shadow or light, except at the beginning mm -hmm. when, as Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, the villain's face is hidden by shadows. Uh, I, to build some suspense, you know, is it the guy whose newspaper photo we saw, uh, mm -hmm. whose wanted picture we saw? And of course it is. And then at the end, at the dock, we get some more kind of classic film noir shadow and light play. So I think uh, she did a really great job uh, considering that too. And yes, the framing, Whitney mentioned framing, and I think Daphne did too. And uh, there are just some incredible shots in this film. So I think she did a wonderful job, an excellent job. Yeah. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I think, yeah, I think she's got some, some good angles to show the action or let you see what you're supposed to see kind of thing mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. The shot when they're changing the tire and Emmett Myers is hiding in the car with the door propped open. Right. But, um, I, I, that was interesting. Um, and this to me kind of leads us into uh, the cinematographer. So Nicholas Musaraka, and this is the top shot, Joseph, you may recognize mm -hmm. Jane Greer, Robert Mitchum, and Jacques Tournier, past. yeah, as they were when they were filming out of the past. And Mr. Musaraka is the one on the right, the white haired or gray haired. Um, and so, you know, he has such a wide range of projects. I just decided to pick one, which is The Stranger on the Third Floor, starring Peter Lorre, which a lot of people consider to be like the first film noir. It's, it's, a, it's like an ongoing argument. Well, when did film noir start? So anyway, um, right. you just look at these shots, right? And look at the, it, it, he's at this time, you know, he I'm, he's described as painting with light and shadow, you know? Mm -hmm. I uh, love it. Yeah. There's the, the shot, it's so interesting, you know, without mm -hmm. even knowing what's going on, you know, there's somebody right. standing up yeah. on the stairs, there's... Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter Lorre fleeing with a scarf on. And I don't know what's the other one is some sort of a yeah. setup. Somebody's waiting uh, for, I don't know, execution or something. Um, you don't even need a trailer for the, this mm -hmm. movie. Uh -uh. You, you just show these shots. Of these shots and you want to see it. Yeah. Well, and here's, here's three more. Mm. Oh, wow. Wow. So this is, this is, I think obviously a mat of some type, but it's still a very cool shot. I yeah. mean, the, the city, the, the skyscrapers, was still very cool. And then the other ones, just the light and shadow are like, they're like pieces of art. I mean, mm -hmm. it's insane. Yeah. It is. There's so much going on in each. Oh, yeah. And like you were saying, it's like a, a tr it, you don't need a trailer. You're like, what is happening? What's going on? I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a that's a really interesting movie as well. Um, that's also sort of a. They could call it the psycho on the third floor, as far as that goes. Um, so anyway, I, I, it's hard to say. Like in this film, there's not as much of that light and dark because a lot of it's in bright sunlight, but it's actually still there. You know, when you mm -hmm. there's shadows as they go into the, uh, you know, where they're buying some groceries, and then there's some, he plays with light and dark in the cars, and then at night uh, when you've got the fire going, etc. Um, and then, uh, the, the ending scene has a lot, right. Mm -hmm. As, yeah. as, uh, Myers walks out on the, mm -hmm. or as, uh, Edmund O'Brien's character mm -hmm. walks out on the, uh, dock and you can't see, you can't see where he's going, who's there, who's up, you know, uh, you see some of that shadow play on the one scene, um, where the two, Fishermen are the main. I, I'm really bad with the names right now. Um, but uh, Gil and Roy, I think. Gil, yeah, Roy, yeah, yeah. So when Gil and Roy, when they were waking up and to try to leave, the shadow play between that scene and then seeing um, the the nemesis like wake up and and then you would see some of that play into it in that scene. Some of the shadows mm -hmm. coming up and that tension. There was one scene when they were in the desert, and I, I don't know if it was when 
they were like eating and I think that a car was coming. Maybe it was one of the police cars and mm -hmm. they ran from kind of a rocky area through the space between two really large rocks, yeah. like through a, almost like a hallway, a natural hallway out to the other side. And yeah. I thought that was really cool. A really beautiful shot too. That yeah, was, it was. Um, I was going to mention when we were talking about Ida Lupino, there is a, uh, box set of I think it's it's uh, films that she directed from Kino oh. Classics Kino oh, wow. Warber that include mm. uh, this one Not Wanted, Never Fear and The Bigamist Cool Nice. So that's, that's out there if people are into that um, with her directing work So yeah, any, any other comments on the cinematography other than this guy's like a, I just can't believe he's never won an Oscar I don't know gosh I don't know I mean I think we've said what we wanted to say I, I mean I love the wide range even how things were done in these desolate spaces in the desert and and then just seeing the capture of that nature I and you know really questioning it wait where, where is this really being filmed at you know that kind of mm -hmm. thing because it, it, it was really neat to see the nature and then how things were captured yeah so our uh our lead villain is william tallman which we probably all know from perry mason mm -hmm. he was the da hamilton burger yeah and the, the Scene below that is from a movie called <laughs> Big House USA. But you recognize the other people in that scene? Yeah, is that? Uh, I can't. In the, the one on the, the one bottom on the left, left. Is, yeah. Yeah, the one on the left is Charles Bronson. Uh huh. And hmm. then um, William Tallman. I what can't. were you going to say, Joseph? Oh, and no, the next, uh, just Bronson. Yeah. And then uh, second from left or second from right is Ralph Meeker. And far right is, it's kind of hard to tell what the face he's making, but that's Lon Chaney Jr. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and the cast in this movie is unbelievable. And it was like, I think it was 50, 55. So wow. it's su surprising how uh, these all get paired up with he was he so tallman got a start kind of he made a lot of noir in the early 50s before he got the hmm. the perry mason gig and then that was kind of the deal you know did did like 10 years of that or however long that was on and 225 episodes i used to watch i've seen a lot of perry mason and i definitely recognized him in this but i couldn't tell you that it was the same i i didn't couldn't identify that that's who it was um, he did such a, a good job wow. in this movie <laughs> and uh, he just, disgusting. yeah. And you, th and you think, wow. And he's so like, you know, LADA here in Perry Mason, but he's this, just totally crazy psycho. He did such a good job. Yeah. So this is, you know, that gun, that was, that was a big advertising thing that shot close oh, up of wow. the gun in the back seat. And I know I had another one of him. Yeah. The sleeping with his eye, one yes. eye open. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that, isn't that creepy or what? Mm -hmm. that, that that's something idea. that's very mm -hmm. scary to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's something uh, I remembered from watching it the first time. I mean, that stays with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he gives his little, uh, you know, monologue about it. And then mm -hmm. uh, we get, at first a shot of him with both eyes open but then later in another scene they think you know he might be asleep but there's just no way of knowing for sure no. because of that and that kind of harkens for me back to uh the telltale heart by edgar Allan poe mm -hmm. and his eye his eye so that adds a little bit of horror element when i watch it as well yeah, he's got a uh, one one eyelid is paralyzed, and he doesn't. Mm -hmm. he, 
right. I suppose he can, I don't know if he can blink or not, but it's stuck open all the time. And he tells those guys, you know, you guys try to escape if you not want, but you can't tell if I'm sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you always hear that. What's that, that saying about sleeping with one eye open. Right? Eye open. Yeah. Well, the, the, they did a great job with the tension because I, you know, lots of times you hear something like that, or you, you don't know if the bad guy is, you know, uh, can tell if someone's trying to get away or not. But I was really like, I had no idea if he was faking it or if he really was asleep. I really felt that tension um, both yeah. times when they were watching, when they tried to escape and when they were just kind of like checking him out and trying to figure out if he was telling the truth or not about it. And yeah, it was great. It's the one thing that you kind of stay on, like the, that's where you're fixated throughout the mm -hmm. whole film. Because yes, like you, Daphne, I wasn't sure, like, is he just messing with them? Is this an act? Because he's, mm -hmm. you know, messing with them throughout this whole entire thing, mm -hmm. uh, playing with their emotions, moving them along. And it just how much he has really pulled on them and even so far as to take, you know, his, his whole, not just his persona of being this horrible person, this terrifying guy that's going to make them think that, oh, he's going to, is he really going to kill them this whole time you're questioning? And these guys are questioning that too, but you see it, you feel it with his own wardrobe because the guys, they're not wearing dark, obscure colors, mm -hmm. but he's wearing mm -hmm. this jacket that's black and dark and he's got more mm -hmm. of a darker aesthetic and mm -hmm. then later he messes with one of the guys was it oh um the bigger frame one um i'm, I'm sorry was that, i should was know that, that gil was that gil gil, gil? Yeah. yeah and when he he says that he's saying that they need to switch clothing mm -hmm. to, and because... oh no that's that's roy that's roy. Oh, roy, okay, okay. Whoa, sorry about that yeah, but yeah Brian. no but no even even just to go so far as to you know, not just with that look of his eye, mm -hmm. but just turning around and using his own aesthetic and using that as a control factor too. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's so much to him, and that those are the two things with his and, look well, that he used. <laughs> and you're totally right. When he was wearing the other outfit, he looked less threatening. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, and which was scary because you knew who he was in this in this outfit, you know, he was totally, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Just the lighter clothes yeah. and the, and the lighter even weight of the clothes, mm -hmm. um, with the leather jacket and stuff. Another part that I thought was really good is how he kind of, um, kind of just liked to talk about how horrible his life was and how much the, the other guys were just, you know, soft. weak. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Soft and weak. Mm. It was like, wow, you sure, like talking about, you know, I mean, like it was just really, there was some depth there to this character. It wasn't just this like crazy well, guy. And then at yeah, the end, I, when he, when he had the, when he had the handcuffs on and he like, I mean, he, he could have been chewing scenery there, but I was like, no, he's, he's freaking out that he's, right. he's busted and he can't yeah. believe that he was ever going to, anything was ever going to happen like, to Well, him. I think it's yeah. like a caged animal, right? Yeah. Almost, right. Like. And one of them told him, like, he wouldn't be as threatening or he wouldn't be anything if it, you know, What's he like that having gun? that gun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was another thing. So it was that that look, his face, the eye, just the appearance, the mm -hmm. aesthetic. And then, of course, he's he's got that one powerful weapon that he is, you right. know, using to manipulate and control everything. <laughs> and his reaction when the character told him you'd be nothing without that gun mm -hmm. was interesting too because yeah. that was rolling through his head yeah he mm -hmm. didn't like instantly deny or right. try mm -hmm. to toughen up mm -hmm. right he didn't yeah uh raise his ire he's really ire he was really thinking about that oh it well, struck this, this, a nerve mm -hmm. definitely yeah. struck a nerve yeah well and this is a good example of difference in time so like when they want to show what a badass he is, he says that line we used at the beginning about, you know, how his parents didn't care about him. Uh, right. I, I forget mm -hmm. what it was. Um, when I was born, they took one look at my puss and told me to get lost, you know. I, like, <laughs> that's just not, now that's just not, <laughs> not that evil. Or the thing mm -hmm. like, oh, I used to have a watch like that, but nobody gave it to me. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. took it. Yeah. You know? Yes. <laughs> like, okay. Um, and it kind of reminds me of Cape Fear because in the, the Cape Fear from the 60s, when they want to show what a badass Robert Mitchum is, he bumps into a woman outside the library and knocks a box of books out of her arms and, and just keeps on walking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that shows you he's, he's oh, what a, what a bad Cad. character. Yeah, what a cad, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, it, it's effective, though, because, mm -hmm. uh, and that top picture is, it's hard to see here, but his face is just grime. And that was mm -hmm. another thing I liked about this is as time went on and in the environment they were traveling in, they got grittier and grimier mm -hmm. and their yes. hair got all oily and messed up. And I, I liked that, the, mm -hmm. the realism yeah. in that. Mm -hmm. They were so happy to be able to just kind of rinse their faces in the murky mm -hmm. yeah. water yeah. Oh, yes. that, that, yes. he, that he wouldn't even touch. You right. know? Yeah, so. yeah. But I think uh, that also so used to uh, living on the run and, mm -hmm. you know, being filthy and dirty that he didn't need have that sensation of trying to clean yourself that those mm -hmm. two, that the two protagonists had. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And then one of the protagonists even said to him, you stink <laughs> like yeah. as a person, but I mean, right. Yeah. But you also, yeah. your clothes Close smell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. Um, yeah, I loved that. You could tell he was he was getting to him. Oh, it was yeah. uh Well, and I think you know, we kind of passed it by, but they they uh we already know that he hitched a ride with a couple and killed them. Yes. And mm -hmm. then he hitched a ride with a uh, a guy, single driver, and he killed him Argonia. and took the car. Uh, uh yes, until he uh, ran out of gas and then hitched like it was his car and get me to the gas station kind of thing. Uh so these guys have no and, and he says right off, this is who I am. And so they know he's this escaped convict that killed this couple, you know, so. Right. Uh, and then he makes that mark. You know, that's another tense thing. I thought it was very smart how he told them to do things that he could still maintain control, like put both hands on the top of the steering wheel that so he mm -hmm. could see him. And he told the he told Gil to put one arm up on the window and the other arm on the back of the seat. Mm -hmm. And then when they hit a big bump and his arm slipped off, he actually would have shot him if, if there wasn't an empty chamber in the gun. Yeah. Um, and then he, he puts an exclamation point on that with, I had to use it before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gosh. Well, and, and knowing that, that he did those things to that couple and, another it was and it just made you i don't know if any of you felt nervous when you see that one character that little girl that i think is like basically the yeah. only girl yes. and then yes. he, well you know what he's done and then he's in there at the at the store mm -hmm. um at that shop that tienda and then he's like and that girl's asking him for the apple well one thing she wants the apple mm -hmm. and she's tugging at him and i'm like mm -hmm. Please don't do anything. To this girl. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, let's take a look at uh, yeah. Edmund O'Brien, who played Gill. And I threw a couple things at him up. He, this is like his first movie role in uh, the, Hunch, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, oh. in 1939. Uh. I mean, he's a he's a young dapper. Yeah. Yeah thespian there oh, right yeah definitely uh and then the um, the next one is uh doa which is uh, actually okay. another movie that is horror jason i would say um hmm. another film noir where uh, somebody poisons him and it's a slow acting poison and he finds out so he's got a, a certain amount of time to catch the villains oh, wow. uh and I threw that extra picture up there just because Neville Brand, the guy with the gun is Neville Brand uh, from, uh, I always get these mixed up, Laredo, I believe, and assorted movies since then. Um, Jeff, I wanted to jump in quickly because you mentioned DOA also being a horror adjacent film noir. And at the beginning of this episode, I mentioned that in the 90s, I took a break from horror and got 
into noir. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I kind of had a personal philosophical reason for doing that. And I thought next to horror, uh, film noir uh, has kind of some of the strong elements of the threats of danger and the threats of violence, um, but without a lot of the uh, garish or more sensational sides of mm -hmm. horror films. And it's more deeply exploring, uh, of course, this is a case by case mm -hmm. basis with each film, but more deeply exploring the psyches behind the villains. If you take your average slasher film, and I'm not talking about the, you know, the classic ones like Halloween or Friday the 13th mm -hmm. sequels, where we get a backstory for the main villains, but a lot of the knockoff thrasher films that didn't really bother to have uh, a reason or they had a corny one but the film noir often we get uh, even if it's like exposition like we have in this film uh, you get a background on the killers and why they're doing what they're doing and the kills mm -hmm. of, of course that's a product of the times too but uh, they're not as uh, lurid or garish yeah as later horror films would be. Well, so and, anyway, and they use a lot of spinning newspapers to catch you up on the yeah. <laughs> exposition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. That's very true. But anyway, that's, uh, I just wanted to jump in with that as to yeah, yeah. why I kind of went the noir direction for a while. And, uh, well, I like what you just said. Yeah, I like noir a lot, but some of it is extremely misogynistic. I mean, um, sure, but a lot but, of films um, of that time are. I, I don't know if yeah, that's right. a, not really an excuse, but an explanation. Uh, right. So it's kind of nice that that doesn't happen in here. The men are just being bad to other men. <laughs> so, right. yeah. I want to ask a quick question too about the rest of you. I had flashbacks to when I, uh, when I watched it for our episode to when I first watched uh, The Hitchhiker, uh, you know, 20 something years ago or longer. Um, I thought that Gil and Roy were up to something. Oh. Because at the beginning, it's kind of set up, uh, they've not been honest with their wives where they mm -hmm. were going. And they were talking about it's been a while since they'd seen the barmaid at a certain mm -hmm. bar in uh, Mexicali. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they're just, it seems like, oh, uh, do these guys have a secret? And is there going to be a twist? So uh, for me, the opening of the trunk. I thought, oh, this is going to be it. Oh. <laughs> but no, there was nothing. Yeah. So I just wondered if anybody else was kind of wondering that about the two characters as well, or if that was just me try, you know, uh, trying to anticipate what was happening. No, the trunk scene especially, that made me think a little bit about it. And what's funny that you say, like, were they, like, if we thought maybe there would be something in the beginning, if they were up to something or not, when of course they're not, but later with this guy and he starts saying something to them. And I don't remember word for word, but he, he starts um, saying how he was just picking their brains. I can't remember what he said exactly, but he, it was something to the effect of them being so far away from home and with him. I, I don't know if any of you remember or know what I'm yeah, trying to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When he figures out yeah. they're not where they're supposed to be, he's to be. like, yeah. oh, right. naughty, naughty, yeah. you lied to your wives. Yes, you know? exactly. Yeah. That. Well, it was really exactly. kind of a, it, they played it like it was a spur of the moment decision. Like they yeah. were heading to the Chocolate Mountains and mm -hmm. then Gil just goes, oh, let's, why don't we turn south? He goes, oh, you mean New Mexico? Yeah, <laughs> let's go to Mexico fishing. <laughs> but but the I way he says the, it is it's uh, a little odd you know yeah i love the uh scenery when they were supposedly 
on a street in Mexico with all the neon mm -hmm. signs for the bars and everything. Yeah, Mexico. that was awesome. I wonder where they shot that. That was really great. That was awesome. That was cool. I didn't think that they were up to anything. Um, like I didn't really think there was necessarily something in the trunk. I, I didn't catch that, but I definitely was like, okay, they're, they're considering doing something that maybe they aren't being totally honest about and they're kind of dancing around it for sure. But uh, no, I didn't think like there was a body in the trunk or something. <laughs> well, and, and <laughs> but the weird thing there was is definitely all... something up though. There was definitely, there was something going on. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And for all we know, you know, when they, when they got someplace, they would, would have uh, called home and said, Hey, we decided to go here instead, but they don't get to that. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, right. The the Gil has kind of a look on his face, like uh, like he's just sort of tired of his life, you know. Like let's mm -hmm. yeah. go do something different. Mm -hmm. But then later on, that he mentions he has a wife and a child, and mm -hmm. I don't know that kind of changes, you know. And when they have that accidental, almost accidental shooting in the car, he's really really shook up by that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, well, I so, felt like he was going he was going along with Roy to go to Mexicali and then he kind of just mm -hmm. started pretending like he was asleep. It's, it was yeah. almost like For he was willing to now. go so far. Yeah, was willing to go so yeah. far, but when he had to, he's like, No, I can't, I can't, you know, like he wanted yeah. to turn around and go, forget it, let's just go fishing or something. Yeah. So and yeah. then later on when when um the guy was calling him on it, I just felt like he, oh yeah, he he he, think, could, he could pick that stuff out with these guys and play with play with their um, kind of morality a little bit and, yeah, and yeah. stuff. I, I think uh, Roy liked to drink and just a little bit more than Gil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, Gil yeah. he was like, "Oh, let's stop and have a drink at this place," uh, you know. And then he yeah. pretends like he's mm -hmm. asleep when he mm -hmm. tries to get him to do it. So. Mm -hmm. uh, couple other things. Edmund O'Brien is really a, a, just had some great roles. He's just one of those guys you remember. So uh, anybody, anybody know what that top role is there? Mm -mm. Uh, I'm sorry. The man who shot Liberty Valance. Mm. Uh, uh, he's a great character in that. And then the middle one is from The Bigamist, and that's Ida Lupino. Mm -hmm. So he was in the, the Bigamist as well. And then the bottom one I stuck in there. I mean, he's in other sort of related type things. He's in lots of noir films in the forties and early fifties. That movie is fantastic voyage uh -huh. from the sixties, uh, you know, had Raquel Welch, et cetera. And they shrink the right. ship down. Mm -hmm. He's the general. And I picked that picture only because he has a slide rule in his hand. <laughs> He's calculating stuff. I was going to bring my slide rule and open up the show, but my slide rule. Both of those, both of those actors, the protagonists, I definitely recognize their faces, but I couldn't. I must have just yeah. seen them as been a bunch of roles as character actors, or only saw portions of the movies that they were in. But they were, and I, they I were familiar. I believe. I wasn't even, familiar. Sorry, I didn't look. I didn't look it up, but I'm pretty sure Edmund O'Brien had a reputation for drinking as well. Uh, I didn't, I didn't read into his bio, um, but uh, he was a, a really good actor. And in fact, he won an Oscar. I forget what movie it was for. It's not one of the ones I've got a picture of. Huh. Um, anyway, so Frank Lovejoy is another guy you recognize. And so, mm -hmm. Uh, he was in yeah. House of Wax. Uh -huh. He was one of the cops in House of Wax, along with the other guy in the picture is Dap Greer's one of my or Greer, one of my favorite names. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, okay. solid guy, but he he died fairly young. I believe oh. he was like fifty. He died from a heart attack, nineteen sixty two, I think. But he plays this kind of solid character. His first mm -hmm. movie, I don't know if you guys ever have seen this in different TV shows or even in uh, Christmas Story. The first movie he was in was Black Bart. 
<laughs> oh, he played Black Bart? Wow. Yeah. Well, he did not play Black Bart, but oh. he was in the movie Black Bart. Oh. But anyway, I just, I don't know. <laughs> but I thought it, it, he did a good job, too, I think, especially mm-hmm. playing off Edmund, uh, you know, Roy, Edmund mm-hmm. O'Brien's character was like the emotional one. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And he was more the contained, trying mm-hmm. to think it through, figure out how do we get through this. Yeah. So Edmund O'Brien is like, it's driving him nuts that they're not doing anything. We got to do something. We got to do something. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, mm-hmm. which, which could have ended not well. That was another thing that I really liked about this movie is that these and um, Whitney kind of alluded to it that there's the you know there's these stories and these this like emotional um, experience between these two male characters that are very. Um, you know, you got the solid, uh, not talk much, the quiet guy, and then you've got the more uh, emotional one. Um, and their relationship for each other clearly, mm-hmm. they cared about each other. And um, I, I just thought that was great because with Frank Lovejoy, his his um, strong and silent uh, type, you definitely could see undercurrents there. Like, yeah. I love that he spoke Spanish. I yeah. love that he. Um, like cared about the the little girl, yes. you know, that he he kind of missed his family a little bit. I mean, and he's talking about in the being in the military. Um, I felt like they both had a, a, a stuff going on. They weren't just like these stock characters, and mm-hmm. and that was really cool. Speaking of speaking Spanish, I thought it was cool. I don't know how much you could uh, recognize Whitney, but uh, how all of the Mexicans spoke Spanish to each other. Yeah, without any subtitles without or anything. Any subtitles. Yeah. Yeah. The weird thing is, is you can yeah. figure out what was going on. You didn't need mm-hmm. them. I, I just, I yeah. don't know why, but I like that. Sometimes that would irritate mm-hmm. me, but I, I really like that. I thought. It was... Yeah, that caught my attention too. And I tried to think of other um, stories or other movies where some they would do that. They would just let the 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 um, actual language happen and this interaction and you knew exactly what was going on. It didn't feel like they needed to add English to it at all. And yeah, I, I really like that also. In a way you're seeing it from uh, Meyer's point of view, because he doesn't know Spanish and he keeps mm-hmm. telling them don't, don't speak right. Spanish. Right. So it, he was pretty harsh about it. Like today yeah. people, uh-huh. people would joke around or say, or say it and it's offensive. And, but he was definitely, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, of course it wasn't oh, yeah. something that it was cared about. I was like, I don't speak Mexican. Mexican. I don't speak mix. Mm-hmm. I don't. <laughs> yeah, he even got mad when he said gracias. I'm like, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm like, <sighs> which brings us to our next Vendetta. actor, which is my my cool find for the movie. Anyway, is Jose okay. Torve. Um, he played uh, Captain. Is it Alvarado? Yeah, and he's the guy that tracks him down. You know, he kind of gets yeah. instructions, mm-hmm. and he takes off. He finds the oil spot where they damage the mm-hmm. crankcase, and and. He's he's smart. He nails them. They're waiting for him. He knows that they change clothes because he's he talks to people, you know, and finds out that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got a right. uh, hundred and forty credits. Oh wow! And I don't know. You guys probably. I'm, I'm too old. Uh, anybody have any idea who that character is? The, the... I'm not sure. He is uh, one of the Bolivian bandits in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm. Uh, oh, goodness. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen that movie, but. Yeah. I, I don't know why. When it's I a, saw him in movie. this movie, <laughs> I thought, I know that's who that is. And then mm-hmm. I also, in my mind, thought something else. I was wrong, but I was kind of right. And I had, to, I, had to, I had to check it out last night and rewatch the movie. Um, he's also one of the bandits in The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the guy on the lower picture, the guy to the right, is the character they call Gold Hat, who has the, we don't need no, we don't have to show you any stinking badges line uh, that everybody knows about. But this is Jose Torve, who was, you know, like, sort of like the second in command bandit almost. Hmm. So I, I don't know why. Stuff like that I just think is really cool. Here's a guy that was in these phenomenal movies and most people you wouldn't even think that you recognize them almost treasure of the sierra madre is one of my favorite movies the hitchhiker and butch cassidy and sundance kid plus 
another 130 some. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. I didn't go through all of them, but I just kind of scouted out if that was really him. Uh, so I, I just thought it was really, really cool that this guy was the hero. Yeah. <laughs> he is the one that yeah. saves them. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and in, when I was reading about the actual um, person this is based off of and, and the fact that it was a Mexican police officer that caught the um, real um, bad guy, for lack of a word, it's like, it was, I'm glad mm -hmm. that they kept that as part of yeah. the story, right. you know, because lots of times people want to change it to make it, the hero be a particular person or something. But that was really cool, too. I appreciated that. Definitely. And going to talking about how some of the things that you couldn't really understand, but you could see acted out, especially when uh, it's exchanged with him trying to find the guy when he's holding up the picture. I mean, I'm like, well, I mean, and I, I was thinking about that watching that too. I'm like, well, some viewers wouldn't understand, but with certain scenes where he's interacting with people and then showing that image, I mean, it it's, it's pretty much... Mm -hmm. uh, speaks for itself and mm -hmm. for for people to get what he's conveying and yeah, um, yeah. trying to find. Uh, well, you hear, you see him kind of, you see the guy he's questioning kind of nod. So mm -hmm. you know he recognized mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. he asked him a question. And then you see him go kind of like that. And I heard, I the one word I heard that I recognized was kilometers. So I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. he's saying how far back he saw, mm -hmm. right? So I, it was just, I don't know. I he always knew enough. Uh, to me, it stayed more stayed more real. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so add Jose Torve to your list of uh, character actors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, re to remember. Um, so, what else? Anything else we want to talk about here? You mentioned it was on a true story, and it turns mm -hmm. out that Ida Lupino actually yeah. interviewed the two prospectors who they he he picked up two prospectors or, or he hitched I don't know he he uh, two prospectors met the guy um, and survived. I think that's who it was instead mm -hmm. of fishermen. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And she interviewed him. So I, I it really That's makes so me cool. wonder how much of that is true, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. The dialogue mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, like the putting mm -hmm. the hands on the car and right. mm -hmm. hand me the keys and you get out right. of the car first and move over and mm -hmm. then you get out, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I just love that she put that kind of effort into right yeah. into writing this. Um it, and, it makes it and raw. directing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's just really cool. Even the the even the bad eyelid was real right yeah. yes that's disturbing that's mm -hmm. i think that's one of those things in his whole entire aesthetic that stays with you and mm -hmm. not just his demeanor i mean like i said i wasn't quite sure if this was going to if this would fit in categorizing as horror but there's just some things that's scary and he's a scary mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. so well and kind of like we've talked about before like with um the bad seed sometimes mm -hmm. those things are those things are scary right. <laughs> those are, that is terrifying yeah. um that there's there's people like this that yes there really are that this character is based on an actual person a person and, yes. um yeah and that's so, what i thought was scary it was just knowing that this was something that had happened this could real this is real this is yeah. real yeah <laughs> so i mentioned daniel mainwaring as uh uncredited in the in the uh writing uh apparently it was adapted from a story that he wrote about this incident mm -hmm. and uh his name was not included because at that time he was on the hollywood blacklist oh uh, so but his name does appear in other films i'm not going to say which ones and i haven't looked it up but we have talked about him before i know um at any rate um did you read how tallman uh uh, in an incident shortly after the film, a guy stopped him and said, Hey, you're that hitchhiker, right? Yeah. And the driver got out of his car and slapped him across the face. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. No. And he said something like, well, I may never have an Oscar, but I got yeah. that or something like <laughs> that. Oh my That's God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. 
anyway, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you picked this because they had a lot of cool stuff yes. in here. Now, the, the real guy, his name was Billy Cook, and he killed a family of five, including three children. Yeah. And then a traveling salesman, and then he kidnapped these two hunters or prospectors, whatever they were, took them across the border, uh, but was captured by the Mexican police. So executed in uh, December 1952 at San Quentin. Once again, crime doesn't pay. All right. Mm -hmm. If we have nothing else to mention, any final thoughts anybody wants to get across that they haven't had a chance to talk about? No, I need to run, so I'll go ahead first with final thoughts. Okay. Uh, and it, it, I'm going to keep it very simple. This is uh, an excellent example of film noir. Uh, this is great direction by Ida Lupino, who I also love as an actor. And uh, just if you haven't dabbled in film noir before, I think it's a fine place to start, fine film to begin with. And hopefully it'll get you hooked on checking it out. And if you are a noir fan, definitely worth a revisit if you've already seen it. Yeah, it's, it's missing some classic elements that are usually talked about in film noir, but we, we don't care. It, it's a later one, too, 53. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, it really, like you said, Jeff, uh, it's debatable when uh, film noir really first started because it wasn't a movement that was recognized from the beginning. It was a movement that French critics came up with after films had already been made. Right, and they said, right. these are film noir. Right. Uh, and th these are the elements. So, right, for example, we don't have a femme fatale in this right. film, which right. most mm -hmm. noirs do and everything. All right, everybody, I'm sorry, but I need to run. All right. work. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, they don't, Thanks, it's fun to talk you, about. You, Thanks, Whitney. You can take Thanks, that day Joseph. off. You can take the day <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye. 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 He just ignored that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, I, I don't know. Do you guys want to do some feedback? We actually have a ton. Oh, sure. Do you wanna, since we don't usually have time. So we'll do a couple of, couple of iTunes reviews first. Okay. Uh, this one actually is a few months, well, both of these are a few months old, but these are five-star reviews. Oh, cool. This one's from Mona Says Smirk. I like oh. that name. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> five stars isn't enough. Decades of Horror is my absolute favorite podcast. Last Halloween, 2020, I happened upon the 1934 film, The Black Cat. And from there, I found this podcast. And I've seen so many classic horror films. You guys and girl, girls now, are such a wonderful, yes. or women. I, uh, <laughs> you guys, girl, are such a wonderful team. I love to listen to the different views on a specific film, and then I watch it. You make me laugh, and you give me something to look forward to in these crazy COVID days. My only complaint would be that you don't make an episode every week. But I guess you do have... Each have lives to live. Much love. And Aww. I can't I can't wait to hear what you do next. Faithful listener, Lisa in Tennessee. So that's awesome. That is those super are, awesome. Are, that's great. It yeah. is. It is. Um, and then this one was uh, from January from Tom Loy. Another five-star review. It says, a quick comment regarding the great discussion of Son of Kong. Orson Welles very much was inspired by the special effects work at RKO and specifically the original King Kong. And yes, a snippet from King Kong was used in a brief glimpse out a window at Xanadu. Wow. Wells made use of a number of optical effects perfected in King Kong and used many of the same matte painters. I'm not scolding. Please know <laughs> that. I'm a journalist and happen to have the twin obsessions of King Kong and Orson Welles. So, you know, he's... <laughs> He's a knowledge monger like we are. Nice. Those <laughs> are cool <laughs> obsessions, too. <laughs> it is. It is. They are cool obsessions. Uh, Wells himself spoke about the special effects work at RKO. At any rate, thanks for the podcast and dedication to talking about horror films through the decades. You folks have always been great, but you've been a helping hand through this pandemic. Thank you, Tom Lowy. So, very neat. 
Um, nice. And I have to, I literally, I have to go back and listen to Son of Kong to get what he's talking about. Um, Ed Martinez was on that show. Mm-hmm. And I know we, we spent some time talking about some of the special effects. So we might have wondered about something about that. So now I've got to go back and see what Tom was talking about so I can actually learn something. Can I, can I say something real quick? Absolutely. Um, just from the comments, it's um, the first, uh, the awesome Mona Lisa smirk. Um, I loved it. Yeah. I, yeah, um, I, uh, that's exactly how it was for me for the seventies. And then um, just listening to, cause my, um, do we have time for this? Sure. <laughs> um, if you have time, we have time. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that I, I, um, my experience with horror was when I was a, when I was a kid in the seventies, I was a total scary, scaredy cat, super sensitive. Everything hit me just perfect for horror. I was the perfect um, uh, person for horror, but I was way too scared to actually watch it. And, but um, so when I started, when the, finally the switch was clicked in my head that I understood that it's, um, you can have fun. It's safe. And you can, you can actually enjoy being scared. Right. And that, you know, I had that um, uh, ep- epiphany for lack of a better word and started watching all these again. It was like so awesome to find the seventies and to listen to it being talked, you guys talking about it and then going back and watching it and, um, and same with classics in the eighties. So talking about, um, this habit of listening to it and then watching it. I totally, I totally get it. And there's so many times when um, it was, you guys were there and it was oh. awesome to listen to. <laughs> so I hear them totally. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I was, you know, my first, the first thing I can remember being totally completely scared of was Tarzan films when gorillas were chasing him. <laughs> that scared the hell out of me. And I still haven't found it. I have a, I have a very vivid memory of a gorilla chasing Tarzan up a vine on a cliff mm-hmm. <laughs> and just being scared to death. And in fact, I went like around the corner in our from our TV and faced the wall in the corner mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. said, Mom, tell me when it's done, <laughs> you know, yeah. even though yeah. it was like, well, let's change the channel. No, no, don't right, change yeah. the channel. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's that's me. <laughs> Those are my reactions when I was yeah. a kid watching some of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> or I would get that question, like, you shouldn't be watching it anyway. <laughs> or like, comment, rather. Right. Well, I don't want to talk about that. I just want to watch it. But I want yeah. you to let me go sit over here for a while. <laughs> I know. That's great. So sorry. Th- sorry for that digression. Oh. But yeah. No, no. That's that's great. I appreciate those <laughs> comments from uh, uh, Mona Lisa and Tom. Yes. Uh, I definitely will check out that information. Um, <laughs> so here's one on our hunt. We have several on our 100th episode. Igor. 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 <laughs> And he says, great choice for your 100th episode and good chat from the crew. Though I'm not sure we need so much time on irrelevant technical mistakes, but horses for courses, I suppose. (laughs) So I'm not really sure what he's talking about. I listened to it. We had problems, but I thought I edited all that stuff out, except (laughs) for the one time Joseph came back in and said he, I don't know, fired up his like triple cyclonic something or another. (laughs) I I don't know. (laughs) I tried listening again, and I just am not sure uh, what they're talking about, but point taken. Remember, by the early Universal Cycle movies, even horror films were fully cinematic in terms of artistic expression, cinematography, angles, tracking, etc. Frankenstein, like Dracula, was in some ways a filmic step backward in that the production requirements necessary to add sound forced a more stagey look feel, and pace overall. And oh boy, did Whale and company pull it off. To me, this film is the epitome of gothic set direction. As to the monster itself, Karloff's portrayal here is really an archetype for the misunderstood. I didn't ask to be born this way movie, villain. Put him on one end of the spectrum and Dracula, Dracula on the other 
for movie horror villain archetypes. The monster equals innocent, doesn't know any better. Dracula equals equals driven by pure evil. All other movie villains fall somewhere in the Frankenstein to Dracula spectrum of evil in terms of moral culpability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. fair point. Fair yeah, point. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's why we we talked quite a bit about uh, Frankenstein being the innocent. You know, we mm -hmm. felt sorry. You feel sorry for Frankenstein because yeah. it's anyway. Yeah, it's very interesting to me. And one of the things I love about horror is that it can represent um, evil, but it also can represent the other really well. And I and I'm often attracted to those stories that uh, have that aspect to it. Uh, and then our buddy Dallas Nostromo. Anybody else want to read any of these? <laughs> uh, Sure. Oh, yeah. And, and and we know <laughs> Dallas. Dallas is always joking, right? So, uh, and, and as kind of a lead into this question, we talked about how in the opening credits it says monster, and the the player was question mark. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who who wants to read this? I'll read it. Okay. okay. So he said, "Did you know the monster is actually Boris Karla?" It's true. You can't tell because he's wearing makeup. <laughs> also, this film is based on a true story that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. If I don't know the answer, I'll just do what Chad does and make up some bullpucky. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, Dallas. <laughs> uh, and then I think, I don't know if Sean was re replying to him or not, but Sean Park says, Chad is certainly most excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we said something about Ad being excellent in that. Nice. He sure uh, is. He is most excellent. <laughs> uh, and then we have a great one from Alistair Hughes. At, and Daphne, you want to read that one? It's a oh, sure. Yeah. I love reading Al's stuff. Um, Dear Triple Figure Grew Crew, congratulations on reaching your centenary, my beloved pod family. <laughs> Frankenstein was the perfect choice, and I have nothing to add after your thorough discussion of this towering icon, which horror cinema owes so much to. But I will say this. Daphne and Whitney, I could watch your reactions to Chad's tagline readings all day. <laughs> your barely suppressed white hot hilarity actually made my own cheeks ache with laughter. <laughs> Seeing Whitney's shoulders shake, shaking as she valiantly struggled to hold it together <laughs> while Daphne wiped away actual tears of mirth would set me off again and again. And the stark contrast to Michael's laser focused <laughs> stoicism made it all even worse. Or was that better? Definitely worse for my poor cat who finally had enough <laughs> and flew off my lap <laughs> as I doubled over. That's great. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Not the tone I would have expected for a discussion about Frankenstein, but probably very appropriate that you all had me in stitches. Oh, love it. <laughs> Beyond doubt, one of the most enjoyable conversations I've ever heard about this wonderful film. I love you guys. I am Aww. so very proud of you all for reaching episode 100. Aww, as, Karloff himself, <laughs> as Karloff himself might say in Bride of Frankenstein, Classic era. Good. <laughs> Alistair Hughes. Oh, Al, you're the awesome. Nice. Yes. He is. He's such a sweetheart. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I I actually was laughing pretty hard when I rewatched that too. So That's great. Uh, oh, my goodness. I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> well, it's it, the comment... Uh, <laughs> about michael because i remember sitting there thinking like what is this guy thinking sitting here does he know what he's getting into with us <laughs> so i was keeping an eye on him and he was he was chuckling a few times there. Nice. um all right so this is for the bad seed miss mary mary i love these youtube names yeah. one of my favorite books so yeah, we were talking about that. Um, that we wanted to read the book sometime. Mm -hmm. And let's see, where are we at? Uh, Whitney, would, would you read yeah, this one? Sure. For Kathy? Yeah, sure. Kathy, Ka Kathy Chapman. Love this movie and love this podcast. Everyone in Decades of Horror Classic 70 and 80 feel like family. I will usually re-listen to episodes over and over just to hear the voices of friends. 
keep up the good work, guys and gals. Also, I can. Oh, also, can I suggest a movie classic, 1969, The Mad Room, with Shelley Winters and Stella Stevens? That's severed hand scared the poo. I'm writing that down. out of me yeah. as a child. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Sounds hand. perfect. Oh, oh. For, I don't know about Chad. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta check that uh, one out. I don't I know, yeah, yeah. Oh. I love Shelley Winters. So let's see, Vince. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right. uh, and this is about oh. episode ninety-eight, Island of Lost Souls, from Dusty Old Movies. Another great YouTube name. Mm -hmm. Great video, guys. I look forward to checking out the rest of your channel. I subbed to you guys, too. Awesome. So, excellent. That's what we okay, love here. Cool. Um, and from Thomas Tomas Salinas, who we, we've had other comments. I don't think we did this one before. Um, first off, love everything about this movie. Lawton, the original Wells story, the Wiley script. By the way, the inventors of Superman literally just ripped off his novel Gladiator. I think Chad talked about that. Mm -hmm. And as usual, the group <laughs> crew has some good takes, but also some awkward takes. I find it interesting when people graft their modern sensibilities onto a movie from 80 years ago and discern social political realities from it. I would exercise caution in doing that kind of thing because all you really know is what is being filtered through time from various opinions about a movie. And it was just a movie, not a political thesis, that was largely forgotten for 40 years. I also find current take on the codes and such that existed at that time to be pretty surface level. You realize there are codes now, right? Movies can't often get into production without meeting certain social political standards and narratives, mostly left-leaning, by the way. And all the censorship happening right now is from the left. So do you have an issue with codes or just codes you disagree with? Finally, while I consider the works independently, one thing the movie didn't really capture from Wells' work was the idea that man was transcendent from other animals, not better necessarily, just more advanced. It wasn't necessarily a religious point, though the best parts of religion make these points. But there was much in the book about the hero being reduced to a state of animalistic nature and realizing this duality upon his return to England and commenting on how cruel, harsh, and unenlightened it is to live in such a state. So, um, feedback on that or, or anything? Um, as far as the codes, we talk about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I don't, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the tone was negative, but for the most part, we just look at how it affected the movie. What, did, what was changed in the movie because of the codes? Mm -hmm. And if somebody issued a movie now and then five years from now from when it was reissued had a bunch of cut out of it because new codes were put in, I, we would certainly talk about it and mm -hmm. we wouldn't like it. In fact, yesterday we just did a review of Blood Sucking Freaks, one of the most disgusting films ever made in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we actually said, you know, we, we don't want censorship. <laughs> We certainly wouldn't recommend this movie to anybody, but hey, <laughs> if that's what you want to go see. Um, so anyway, I, I think maybe, I don't know. I also enjoy looking at it from the historical perspective of the history of Hollywood right. and censorship and film. So um, it was a big deal that the Hayes Code was there and that this was all set up. So I think it's, I think it's important to talk about it from that perspective. Um, yeah, uh, censorship nowadays, I know it can be complicated and it comes from different perspectives, but um, I enjoy talking about it because I think it's part of, part of the history of movies. And um, I think yes. it's really interesting to talk about that, especially comparing before the code and after, because it is really relevant to, um, how movies were made, especially coming out from the silent era, things that were going on in society at the time. And um, so I, 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 that's how I take it. If, if my opinion yeah. comes off as I um, am criticizing that, I, my intention is to talk about it historically. And I think it's fair to talk about it. Um, 
without any sort of personal, uh, 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 no, I don't think any personal comments or opinions were being, were meant at least on my part. Um, but I do think it's important. And um, the, I, I appreciate the comments about grafting the modern sensibilities into a movie from a long time ago. And um, uh, I think that's a valid comment. I, I personally think looking at this one, um, it is, I don't think an intention, some, have someone, how I look at it nowadays, I don't think that I am projecting a modern day um, opinion on what the filmmakers were trying to say. Um, you're absolutely right. You have to filter it through the time it was made. But I do think the um, things that were expressed and the ideas that were expressed were definitely very um, relevant to that time in the world. Um, colonialism, um, how people are represented as less than, how religion um, might play a role in that. Um, I'm looking at that historically, and I think that that's, I'm, you don't have to project your modern day views onto, onto what the, the artist intended in the movie, but I think you can look at it historically and say, this is how people, this is how the world viewed things at that time, especially um, Western world. And you can see it as examples in these films. And um, I think that's fair personally, but I appreciate the comment. I think you're right. Oh, it's absolutely. really, it's really important to um, remember the time that it was made and, um, and, and see from what that is, but. Definitely. And I think I might've, I think I said something along the lines of uh, sort of flippantly, like, and then they got, you know, hired a super religious guy to, to run the office. And so that, that was probably, unwarranted it was it was uh probably wasn't it was based on perception rather than fact uh well it's at the causes same rate, a discussion I, right yeah, so, yeah. Well, <laughs> and at any rate I, we always talk about what we what we try to do is watch the movies in terms of the world they were made in mm -hmm. so how shocking was Frankenstein to the people that went and saw it at the theater in 1931? Mm -hmm. And why was it, what, what about Island of Lost Souls did people think was, went over the line and, and was right. censored just mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, you know? Yeah, so, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I may have, I, I don't like anything cut out of film, so. Mm -hmm. Do I not like modern censorship? Yeah, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. All right. So that's all our comments. Mm -hmm. So, Guru Believers, that's it for this episode. But every two weeks, we'll be focusing on a specific film released between 1920 and 1969. Next up is one chosen by me, which is The Most Dangerous Game from 1932 which if I remember mm -hmm. right, was shot on the same set as King Kong, was it? Mm -hmm. Fay Ray and, and Robert Armstrong were, were in both those films. So that should be interesting. Another movie I haven't seen. Looking oh, forward to it. No? <laughs> There's many, many variations <laughs> over the years, but this is the original as far as I know. Plenty of ways to stay in touch. Please send feedback to... Uh, feedback at gruesomemagazine.com or, or better yet, leave comments on Gruesome Magazine's YouTube channel. And you can also go to Gruesome Magazine's H&R and DOH Facebook group um, or there's a place for comments on the Gruesome Magazine website. Uh, and also think about uh, becoming joining our Patreon group. Any little bit helps. We're putting out we're putting out roughly a podcast a day, I think, if you count all the different ones, Heroes and Droids and and uh, Horror News Radio and Gruesome Magazine. So, uh, you know, a couple bucks a month would, would be super. It helps pay for hosting and web space and stuff. I don't have any idea what it is, but Doc tells me about it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, catch us again here in two weeks. 
for another great horror movie of the classic era as only decades of horror can do it. Say goodnight. Good night. Good night.